and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, by the light of the Holy Ghost, hast instructed the hearts of thy faithful. Grant us by the same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Pius X, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <coughs> Who is our Lord Jesus Christ? On this question hinges whether we go to heaven or hell. On this question hinges <clears throat> whether we profess the true faith or not. Everything hinges on this question, who is our Lord Jesus Christ? And really the whole catechism centers around our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> This is the first question in this chapter, Lesson 7, the Incarnation. What is the Incarnation? In the Latin, carne means flesh, in, of course, in, in the flesh, in carne. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He is the second person, the second person, the Son of the Holy Trinity. It was not God the Father who took on flesh. It was not God the Holy Ghost who took on flesh. It could have been, says St. Thomas Aquinas. It could have been. But God in His wisdom chose to give the true wisdom to us because man is rational and his rational nature needs the truth. So the second person of the Trinity is wisdom himself. So wisdom became flesh for us. And as St. Lawrence Justinian said, <clears throat> wisdom has become foolish for man. Foolish because he took on our clay. Foolish because he accepted to be humiliated and spit on and crucified to save mankind, at least those of goodwill, from eternal hellfire. So, who is our Lord Jesus Christ? He is the person of God, the Divine Son, one consubstantial with the Father and the Holy Ghost from all eternity. And this is the prophecy, many prophecies, especially Micaeus chapter 5, Micaeus chapter 5, which says, And you, Bethlehem, out of you shall come the leader whose days are from eternity, and he will lead his people. His days of this future Messiah are from eternity, having no beginning. And that's why St. John in this opening gospel, which is no wonder that the new Mass uh, uh, omitted, deleted, got rid of the last gospel of the Mass of St. John. This is important because that last gospel is actually one of the most powerful Gospels read during an exorcism. When a priest drives out the devils from a person, in the Roman ritual, it's this Gospel of St. John, the last Gospel, one of the most powerful Gospels, professing Christ as God and becoming flesh for us. This Gospel's read and the devils can't stand it and they're driven out from this powerful last Gospel. So, in the beginning was the Word, the Word is the Son. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, apudeum, that is, with Him from all eternity. And the Word was God. He was God, equal with the Father, equal with the Holy Ghost. This is so, so important, because ask any Muslim, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes, I accept Him as a prophet. Do you believe he's truly God? No, he is not God. There's only one Father, and uh, Jesus is just a prophet. He's a creation of God, and that's total blasphemy. So the, the Muslims do not worship the true God. They worship the devil. And as St. Peter Mabimenus told three Arabs who surrounded his bed when he was dying, 
you know, you, you, you must accept Allah, you must accept Muhammad. And, and his response was, Allah is a false god, he's Satan, and Muhammad is burning in hell. He's damnatus est, he's, he's damned. So the Muslims do not worship the true God. The Jews, what do they say about Jesus Christ? They say <clears throat> he's an imposter. They refused him as the divine Messiah. And he came in his father's name, <clears throat> so they refused him. But they will take the one who comes in his own name, the Antichrist. That will be the Jews' Messiah. And uh, St. Pius X said in 1903, this Antichrist is not far off. So the Jews, because they refuse the Son, they therefore refuse the Father. Because the Father so loves his Son. And as Christ said, no one can come to the Father but through me. And no one can come to me unless the Father draw him by his grace. And the Jews received that grace, and as a nation they rejected that. So the Jews refused the true God, so therefore they don't worship the true God. The true Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the Blessed Trinity. They refused the Blessed Trinity. The Mormons... <clears throat> started by Joseph Smith, a man-made religion. They have no Christianity, no uh, Christian iconography at all on their churches or buildings. They have no sign of the cross, no crucifix, nothing. And it's very akin, very blueprinted off the Freemasonic lodges. And in fact, a Mormon actually told me that Chase Bank actually supports the headquarters in New York City. Anyway, the Mormons say that Jesus Christ was brother to Lucifer. That he was brother to Lucifer. This is blasphemy. So he was a creation. Lucifer was the bad boy. Our Lord Jesus Christ was the good boy and the good example to follow. But he's a creature and uh, an, a an angel. And that's false. That's an another blasphemy. And so how do you smell all these false religions? One, ask who founded them. And only one has Jesus Christ as the founder, the Holy Roman Catholic Church of tradition, of tradition, and not the conciliar church, obviously. That was fabricated in 1965 after the Second Vatican Council with a new bastard priesthood, a new bastard mass, a new bastard sacraments, a new bastard rites, a whole new bastard reform, bastard meaning in the French, batard, illegitimate, as Archbishop Lefebvre use that very word to describe the new mass priests, the new mass sacraments, the Vatican II religion. So we refuse that religion, we stay Catholic since, since this her terrible council 50 years ago. But uh, only the Catholic Church is founded by Christ. So all the other man-made religions, they're man-made. So who wants to belong to a religion invented by a man? We won't save our soul in those false religions, including all the denominations of Protestantism. So, who is our Lord Jesus Christ? This is the most important question. And we must know this question, seek to know, seek to know who Jesus Christ, our God, is. Because God so loved the world that He sent, truly sent, in a mission, His only begotten Son. And that mission was to preach and sanctify souls and to govern them and lead them to heaven. And that's why he, he left this to the Pope and the bishops to teach, and the priests to shepherd over the flock and lead the faithful to heaven by believing all that Christ taught and being sanctified in, by his seven sacraments and adoring him as our king. And our state governments, our laws, our constitutions should recognize the kingship of Christ. This is what we Catholics want for our United States of America. For our country, we want a Catholic government. We want the Sacred Heart of Jesus on our flag. We want His name and the Blessed Trinity expressed and adored in the first paragraph of our Constitution. That's the way it's supposed to be. Oh, you're you're being uh, you're being too uh, narrow-minded. You have to open to other religions. Well, what happened when Pontius Pilate reduced Christ to an equal with false religions, forbidden by the first commandment? Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. So when a state says any religion can exist with the support of the state, that's state atheism, as Pope Leo XIII said. That's state atheism. And when you've got an atheistic state, 
you've got divorce, you've got abortion, you've got contraception, you've got self, uh, assisted suicide, killing off of the old people, and everything we're watching today, the rainbow flag horrors that draw down fire from heaven. So, back to this most profound and most simple question. Who is our Lord Jesus Christ? He is the person of God. And He is not the human person. He is not a human person. He is the divine person. And which divine person in the Blessed Trinity? The Son, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. This is so beautiful and so clear. He is not a human person, he's the divine person. And, is hum and, and he has two natures in our Lord Jesus Christ. Each one of us, like Anthony here, Anthony has a human person, right Anthony? Anthony has a human nature. But in our Lord Jesus Christ, he is not the human person, he's the divine person of God, who assumed the human nature in his divine nature. So he has two natures, divine and human, and one person. Anthony here is one person, the human person, with one human nature. Same with angels. St. Michael is one angelic person with one angelic nature. So in Jesus Christ, you have this, this, this miracle of, of the, what, what is called in our catechism and St. Thomas Aquinas, the hypostatic union. It's a big word because it's from the Greek. But it basically is saying that the union in our Lord Jesus Christ is the person assuming the divine nature. You get a very lively image of this in the Old Testament anointings. When Aaron is anointing, as the psalm says, the anointing dripped down his face, down his beard, down over his whole body. And he became anointed as priest. And that's just of the Old Testament. But Jesus Christ, this prefigured Jesus Christ, who is anointed, the oil of the Holy Ghost is poured out, and this divine person makes holy and sacred and soaks through the whole divine the, the whole human nature is, is made one with the divine person, Jesus Christ. That means every single step, every single glance, every single sigh of Christ to His Father, every single word and gesture was a divine action, a divine word, a divine thought, and one with the Father and the Holy Ghost. This was visibly shown when Jesus Christ the King was baptized by St. John the Baptist in the River Jordan, as recorded by those who saw it. They witnessed it. When our Lord Jesus Christ was baptized, He didn't need to be baptized because He had no sin. He's God. He's sinless. So why was He baptized? St. Thomas Aquinas says He was baptized to sanctify the waters. So all the waters of the whole earth, touching His divine person, became worthy to be used for baptism. To wash us, poor sinners, and all the human race who are baptized, wash away sin. So what happened at that moment? The Father, His voice spoke and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye Him. So the voice of the Father thunders through the whole valley. Everyone hears it. And then above our Lord Jesus Christ appears the Dove, the Holy Ghost, in a visible representation. So you have, on that, in that moment, you have the Son, the Holy Ghost, and the Father. The Father, Son, Holy Ghost, the whole Trinity manifested. And Jesus Christ, being pleasing to the Father, because He is His only begotten Son, having no beginning of time from all eternity. So this is our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why we adore Him. This is why we fall on our knees before Him. That's why at Mass we get uh, the whole church and the, everyone gets on their knees. Even the angels tremble before Him. When at the Mass the bread and wine 
are changed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, and the sacrifice of Christ is reenacted on the altar. And this is what one Protestant told me. But he was a minister, actually, and he converted because he saw at the Catholic Mass, the Tridentine Latin Mass, at the elevation, when the priest elevates the host and the chalice facing towards God and not towards the people, he recalled to his mind the, what God told Moses, take that serpent made of bronze, hang it up on the tree for all to see. And Christ said, when I be lifted up, I will draw all things to myself. So a Protestant minister converted because he saw this whole connection to the Mass and to Jesus Christ raised up on the cross and raised up in glory in his ascension where he stands now at the right hand of the Father, sits at the right hand of the Father. So the definition in the Catechism is, by the Incarnation is meant that the Son of God, the Son of God, retaining his divine nature, took to himself a human nature, that is, a body and a soul like ours. So Christ had a body that was united to God. Everything about it was sacred. And his soul always had the beatific vision of the Blessed Trinity. Always. Even, even on the cross. But that's a mysterious suffering Christ went through when he said, Why hast thou abandoned me? And then um, the, the, the Lesson 7 begins with the question, Did God abandon man after Adam fell into sin? God did not abandon man after Adam fell into sin, but promised to send into the world a Savior to free man from his sins and to reopen to him the gates of heaven. So, uh, so, in the scripture, we, saw, we see Jesus Christ called the key of David because the, the, the cross is the shape of a key that opens the gates of heaven. It's the shape of a sword to slay the dragon. And uh, it is that cross on which our Lord fulfilled his, the meaning of his name, Dominus Noster, our Lord, Jesus, Jesus means Yeshua. Jesus means the Savior. The Savior. Who needs to be saved? Those who are in grave danger of death. Or dead already. And the whole human race was dead. Because we're all born dead in original sin. Slaves of the devil. Wrapped in his chains. Every single person born of a woman is born in a slave of the devil. So our Lord Jesus Christ is Savior because He, by His blood and baptism, He breaks those chains with the exorcisms of the ceremony which come down from the Apostles in the Catholic ritual, the Roman ritual. And then when the blood of Christ pours over the soul of the little baby, or adult, the, 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 the Holy Trinity comes to dwell in that soul by sanctifying grace. So truly Jesus Christ is Savior because by his dying on the cross, shedding his blood, he opened the gates of heaven. And how, do we, how are we saved? The only ones saved are those who are now in heaven. Those who are on earth, St. Paul tells us, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And when the Protestants go on and on about how they're saved because they believe, um, well, nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Because Christ himself tells us, be watchful, be vigilant, and pray always, because your adversary, the devil, goes about like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And we could fall, we could slip and fall at any time. St. Philip Neri used to pray, Lord, put your hand on my head, because if you don't, I may fall from the faith and become a Muslim tomorrow. So it's a great grace to profess that Jesus Christ is God and to believe all he taught, which is all contained in Catholic tradition and the, in the Catholic book, the Scriptures. I say a Catholic book because, a side note I know, but a, a, a very important side note, open brackets, for all the Protestants who say Bible alone, sola scriptura, 
First, in the Bible it doesn't say only the Bible is necessary for salvation. It doesn't say that at all. St. Paul says, believe everything we taught you by word or epistle. By word, Catholic tradition and the teaching, and by epistle, what is written in the scriptures. So both scripture and tradition are needed. But a very practical question is, the Protestants are all about the Bible, the Bible, but there was no Protestant before 1517. So who wrote the Bible? And who wrote it? Uh, who prepared a whole flock of sheep to be the pages, the skin, the parchment that needed to be conditioned, needed to be dried, needed to be uh, tanned and treated carefully? It was a very expensive and long, skillful project. And then the monks, it was Catholic monks who sat in the scriptorium for many years of their life, writing each letter, each word of the sacred scripture. And then all the leather, the animals that had to be killed to bind it, <coughs> and uh, all, the, all the illuminative manuscripts with the painting and the gold and the calligraphy. Who wrote the scriptures? Literally, who handed it down from the apostles, from the Catholic Church, who decided which books were valid, which books were not? It was Pope St. Damas Damasus who finalized which books were of the canon of Scripture. So <coughs> Pope St. Damasus was not a Protestant. There were no Protestants until 1517. So who wrote the Bible that they hold so much dear to? It's the Catholic monks, the Catholic popes. Catholic priests, and not everybody had a Bible. They were extremely expensive, and there was no printing press, as we all know, before the 16th century. So, if any Protestant has a true Bible, it's thanks to the Catholic Church, it's thanks to the Catholic monks, it's thanks to the Catholic clergy who took such great care to hand it down. So, close brackets, but an important point. So, our Lord Jesus Christ is Savior. Christus, what does that mean? Christus means anointed. And how is he anointed? As I was saying, the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the Son, anointing the whole body and soul of our Lord Jesus Christ, called the hypostatic union. This is what it is. So where did the hypostatic union take place? This most important event in the history of the human race. Where did it take place? Question mark. We know in a little town of Nazareth, as life was going on and people were shopping and bustling and going about daily business, in a little home took place in a virgin girl chosen by God because she was conceived without original sin. She had to be to be mother of someone so sacred. And this was, of course, the Virgin Mary. And in her womb took place this greatest miracle. So in this moment, Jesus Christ became man on March 25th, the day of the first Annunciation in the town of Nazareth. March 25th, when this angel St. Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary, he said, Hail, Ave Maria, gratia plena, full of grace, Dominus tecum, the Lord is with thee. And literally with her, her because when she said yes to God, the, by the power of the Holy Ghost, and having no carnal relations with St. Joseph, by the power of the Holy Ghost, the Virgin Mary conceived in her womb, the very divine person of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is called the hypostatic union. So Jesus Christ was ordained a priest in the Basilica of the Blessed Virgin Mary. How's that? Hmm. Most priests are ordained priests in a cathedral or in, a, in the history of Archbishop Lefebvre in a tent. But the first eternal high priest of the New Testament of a priesthood that will last forever for all eternity, of which the Old Testament priesthood was only a shadowy pre preparation for, our Lord Jesus Christ was ordained a priest in the cathedral of the Virgin Mary's womb, the most beautiful cathedral ever built by God. 
He's also uh, king because he is God. And he is the only savior because there's no other name under heaven whereby we can be saved. And that's what the angel told the Virgin Mary. So our Lord Jesus Christ is truly the savior of all mankind. And it's only the Catholic Church that defends that he is God. And this fight took place right at the early church. St. John was already saying, if anyone dares to dissolve Jesus Christ, he's of the spirit of the Antichrist. So every heresy and infidelity, such as the Muslims and the Judaic perfidy, attack Jesus Christ and dissolve that he's not God. They say he's not God. He's great, he's holy, he's a prophet, but not God. This is blasphemy. He is God. And this is where the Catholic faith is separated from all false religions because it proclaims Jesus Christ as truly God, as truly the, the high priest, truly king, truly the savior. And Archbishop Lefebvre spoke about this so often. Let me just quote from his, his own words in the great sermon at Lille in 1976, which was called The Hot Summer. Here's his own words. But precisely, why are we firmly resolved not to accept this adulterous union of the church and the revolution at Vatican II? Because we affirm the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why was St. Peter made Peter? Recall the Gospel. Peter became Peter because he professed the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all the apostles proclaimed this faith publicly after Pentecost, and immediately they were persecuted. The Sanhedrin said to them, Do not mention this name anymore. We do not want to hear the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the apostles answered, Non possumus. We can't do this. We cannot speak of our Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot not speak of our Lord Jesus Christ, our King. Uh, you will say, Archbishop Lefebvre continues, you will say to me, is it possible? You seem to be accusing Rome of not believing in the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Liberalism always has two faces. It affirms the truth, which it calls the thesis, and then in practice, the hypothesis, they say, it acts as the enemies do, and with the principles of the enemies of the church, and in such a manner that one is always incoherent, always in contradiction. What does the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ signify? That our Lord is the only person in the world, the only, the only human being who could say, I am God. No one in the history of the human race can say, I am God. Only Christ can say this. And by the fact that he could say, I am God, he was the unique savior of the human race. He was the sole priest of humanity. And it is and its only king of humanity by his nature, and not by privilege or title, but by his own nature because he was the Son of God. Powerful. So Jesus Christ is priest, king, savior. He is truly God, and we adore Him, and the Catholic Church def defends this. To wrap this up, because time is, is quickly passing, all the prophecies from Adam's fall to all the prophecies from Moses, from Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, David, prophesy all the details of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 21, for example, is so descriptive of His passion. Isaiah 53 is almost another gospel because it's so graphic of the passion. And then, um, and then all the prophets, I can't go through them now, but uh, they all point to Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ claimed to be God. I and the Father are one, he says. And the church defines, it's clear, the oneness is not of friendship and morality. It's a oneness of nature with the God the Father and the Holy Ghost. And then uh, Christ confirmed by his miracles, uh, miracles that no one else can do. The greatest miracles are his virgin birth, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension into heaven. No man has done these. 
and then the miracles of curing the blind, raising the dead, and, and giving the power to the apostles and the saints down the centuries to cure, to work miracles in the name, <clears throat> precisely, not of Allah, not Buddha, not Joseph Smith, and not Martin Luther, but our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the one we adore, and we say this in the Holy Mass, Tu solus santus, you alone are the Holy One. Tu solus dominus, you alone are the Lord. Tu solus altissimus, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ. And we proclaim this in every Mass. And we adore Jesus Christ in every Mass, because the Tridentine Mass of the Latin Rite proclaims the royalty of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the enemies had to destroy this Mass and invent and fabricate a new mass of 1969, which we refuse. And don't go to it, it's poison. So we'll close with that until the next catechism next week. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of thy mercy. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, pray, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for, pray for us. St. Christopher, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.